What is up and welcome back to Beyond the Art with Brandon Silvers. As always, I am your host, Brandon Silvers. Hope y'all had a good week. Certainly had to be better than the week that TCU had. And my original plan for this episode was to break down what happened in the national championship game. But what is there to say about a game where one team beats the other team 65 to 7? It was historically bad the worst loss in bowl history, and the worst loss by a top 10 team in the history of the AP poll. Just an anticlimactic finish to the season. Luckily for you, this is Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silvers, and I analyze more than just gameplay. I took notes on everything from pregame on, so let's look at the key takeaways from the worst national championship game ever. All right, for pregame, I watched College Game Day on ESPN like many of you do, and first things first, it's time for Lee Corso to retire. He's 87 years old and he's done a hell of a job for an 87 year old, particularly after having a stroke nearly 15 years ago. And speaking from experience, speaking in general is hard. And speaking on camera is incredibly hard. The fact that he's still able to do all that after having to relearn how to speak after that stroke is nothing short of a miracle. But it is time to go. He's had an incredible career in football. He played at Florida State, where his teammate and roommate was Burt Reynolds. He coached in college. He coached in the USFL. And while working on game day, he was also the director of business development for Dixon Ticonderoga in the offseason. That's right, the number two pencil people. I cannot for the life of me remember the last time I held an actual wooden pencil in my hand. But our guy Lee was out here slanging these things for the premier number two pencil company in the country. And I wonder what his role was in brokering whatever deal that the Dixon Ticonderoga people had with the people over at Scantron that made number two pencils the only pencil you could use to take a Scantron test. Lee has done it all. It's time for him to go relax, maybe come back on every now and then for a special occasion to put the mascot head on, but it's time to move on. And ESPN seems to know this as well as they brought on Pat McAfee, who I imagine is Lee's replacement. Lee has been an animated guy even as he slowed down, but going from Lee to Pat is like going from decaf coffee to Walter White's meth. And you can't even follow sports coverage without knowing who Pat McAfee is. He is the Dixon Ticonderoga number two pencil of sports personalities at the moment, and I'm not even really sure how it happened. He's a former Pro Bowl punter with the Colts who retired somewhat surprisingly to host the Pat McAfee show for Barstool Sports after the 2016 NFL season. He has since left Barstool, but the Pat McAfee show has exploded. He has over 2 million subscribers on YouTube where he gets hundreds of thousands of viewers each day on his daily live stream. He typically does his live streams in a black tank top and his wardrobe choices frightened older viewers of game day when he first started coming on regularly this fall. Criticism of what he wears is a little bit stupid to me, but he can certainly afford a whole new wardrobe after signing a four-year $120 million deal with FanDuel. So he does the Pat McAfee show daily, he does game day, he works for WWE Smackdown. The man is everywhere and I am fascinated by this. I study him and what makes his show successful to pick up some tips for what I'm doing here. His production for his daily live stream is ridiculously good and they know how to clip stuff and use good thumbnails when they post it on YouTube. He's also able to get interesting guests and he's super high energy all the time. I can't think of anybody in sports who outworks him. But outside of his work ethic and production value, I cannot and do not want to replicate a lot of what he does. He's very Joe Rogan-esque in that he appeals to the everyman, which is to say that he appeals to middle American working class white guys. I obviously cannot do that, nor do I have the desire to. And like Rogan, he's able to get guests that nobody else can get, like Aaron Rodgers, because the guests know that A, it's going to be a good conversation, and B, they're not going to be pressed on anything they say. I first became familiar with McAfee when Aaron Rodgers got caught lying about his COVID vaccination status. Rodgers has a weekly segment on the Pat McAfee show, so obviously everyone wanted to hear what he had to say the segment after this news broke, and McAfee caught a lot of heat for challenging nothing that Rodgers had to say. Pat's response to this was, hey, y'all know I'm not that kind of a journalist, so what do you expect? which is refreshingly honest, if not an admirable point of view. Pat pulled the same thing earlier this year when he had an issue with the NFL's licensing body over him using NFL logos on his show. It was a weird move on the league's part, but Pat's response was even weirder as he said the quiet part out loud basically by threatening to start being more critical of the league if they didn't resolve this. He said, quote, it's been great doing business with you. I'm happy we have covered your league in the way that we have for the last few years. I'm appreciative of the league and everything it's done. I don't think we've really touched on many subjects we could have dabbled into. 
and I think we'll do that this offseason for sure. Things I know a lot about that my friends know a lot about like insurance and CCE and concussions and everything like that. I think we can find some people to chat about to learn more about what the NFL should be held accountable for and what they shouldn't be held accountable for because I thought the entire deal with the NFL the professional American Football League, I'm so sorry, that I wanted to get involved with was making the game celebrated. So here he has this huge platform and has specific insight into these super important issues, but he hasn't spoken on them already even though they affect him and his friends. And we can assume since they resolved the issue with the NFL that he won't be speaking on them anytime soon. That is weird to me. But best I can figure, his eagerness to not be critical of people and institutions in exchange for access hasn't affected his success at all. In fact, it's probably helped fuel it. It pays to be one of the bros who appeals to other bros, and I'm guessing the bros don't care about these issues. So why even try to do better at all? ESPN is certainly all in on him, letting him host simulcasts of college football games on ESPN2, which I love the concept of, even if I'm not a huge fan of the execution, and it paid off for ESPN this year, as the title game simulcast saw a 206% increase in viewership from last year. However, as you may have guessed, I was not one of those viewers because I'd had enough of McAfee by the end of the pregame show, so I kept it on ESPN. Moving on, let's talk music it would appear that college football did not get the NFL's memo that hip hop is now mainstream enough to play for football fans. So they had multiple pregame performances by a woman named Kelsey Ballerini, who Wikipedia tells me is a country pop singer. I'm incredibly biased and I spend a lot of time ranting about music at sporting events, but you can't tell me that there are more college football fans who are fans of whatever country pop is than there are college football fans who are fans of hip hop. So please college football, be brave. You can even reach back a generation or so and bring on some acts that get our nostalgia all fired up if you need to. There are even plenty of southern hip hop acts you can book if you want to keep it quote unquote country. Nelly has a whole country career now. He's probably more country than Kelsey Ballerini. You got Nappy Roots, Bubba Sparks if you must, Ludacris. Hell, maybe Pat McAfee can rap, I don't know. These would all be suitable choices and that's just off the top of my head while I was watching that performance on mute. Which brings me to the national anthem. We play this before every sporting event, which is weird. The Pentatonics, who I also don't know and look like the cast of a teen drama on the CW, sang it. It's a very hard song to do well. Your goal going into it is just to remember the words and not mess up or get weird like Fergie did at the NBA All-Star Game that year. Truly legendary singers like Whitney Houston and Marvin Gaye have been able to do something with it, but how many singers on that level even exist? I mean, Whitney and Marvin don't even exist anymore. And it's not a song that gets you fired up to play a sport, so let's revamp it. We need it to be inoffensive, but hype you up to play sports and be American, but also easy enough for the average human to perform or sing along to it. Which is why I'm proposing that we let the Quad City DJs come up with our new national anthem. Listen to the Space Jam theme song and tell me something like that wouldn't get you fired up like Pat McAfee doing a jackknife into a river at 9.30 in the morning in Knoxville in October. I mean, do you not sing along and do the train conductor arm motion thing in unison with everyone else when the other Quad City DJ song, Come On and Ride It, aka the train song, comes on in a public setting? Joe Biden, do the right thing and commission the Quad City DJs to create our new national anthem. You know who would be my last pick to remake the national anthem? Whoever made that whopper, 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 whopper song for Burger King. Whoever made that song, I hate you. It's on three times every commercial break. It's the fucking Pat McAfee of commercial jingles. Everywhere I turn, I hear it. Please make it stop. I can't get it out my head. Okay, so this is the point of my notes where we're getting closer to the game actually starting. If you have followed me on social media or talked to me for any length of time, really, you know my issue with the national championship game and the Super Bowl is that it's ridiculous not to play these games on Saturday night. Can anyone explain to me why we don't? I want to enjoy myself and it's hard to do that knowing that I'm gonna have to wake up in the morning and work, but that's a problem for another day. So for the coin flip, each team brought out legendary football players alongside their team captains. TCU brought out LaDainian Tomlinson who once ran for 400 yards in a game for TCU and is the person who brought TCU to my attention as a child. I completely forgot that he also scored 31 touchdowns in a single season in the NFL. For some perspective, Austin Eckler led the league this year with 18 touchdowns. For their legend, Georgia brought out Matt Stafford. Now he was good at Georgia, good enough to be the number one overall pick in the NFL draft when he came out of college. He's been an okay NFL quarterback, he won the Super Bowl last year, but him being out there 
had more to do with Herschel Walker turning into Georgia's Kanye West, which got me thinking, who is the more disgraced Heisman Trophy winner, Herschel or OJ? Comment below, let me know. So the game started and with 9.32 left in the first quarter, I was already wondering if this was gonna be a blowout, which turned out to be a huge understatement. The score was only seven to nothing at this point, but Georgia's scoring drive looked so easy and TCU's offense looked so overmatched that it was obvious to a non X's and O's person such as myself. Now, Georgia's quarterback, Stetson Bennett, first of all, is named Stetson Fleming Bennett IV. And he very much looks like a Stetson Fleming Bennett IV. And his story has been talked about ad nauseum, how he walked on at Georgia, left to go to junior college, came back, led Georgia to the national championship last year, and again this year. And the big thing is how unlikely this all is because he's not the most talented guy in the world. I mean, he plays like a guy named Stetson Fleming Bennett IV, who looks like a guy named Stetson Fleming Bennett IV except for his haircut. This season in particular, Stetson has shown up for games with a lineup that is nothing short of extra crispy. I know y'all don't come to me for hair analysis, but this appears to be a lineup that can only be done by a black barber. And after watching him run for not one but two touchdowns in the first half, looking more like Mike Vick than Eric Crouch when doing so, I couldn't help but wonder if anybody has looked into how going to a black barber has affected his rushing stats. I'm going to have to try to do some research on this and see what I can find. Also, Stetson's main weapons on offense were guys named Ladd and Brock. Now, before you ask, yes. And as a result, during the game, you heard the phrase sneaky athleticism almost as much as you heard that Whopper song. Whopper, 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 Whopper. Sneaky athleticism has to be white people's articulate, right? I mean, Brock Bowers is 6'4", 230, and he runs a 4'5", 40. Ain't a whole lot sneaky about that. And Brock doesn't have a hairline that supports my theory on, on the Black Barber thing either. But back to Stetson, though. Much has been made about him being 25 years old, and with all his transferring and the COVID year not counting towards his eligibility, he's been in college a long-ass time. And him being so old reminds me of one of the most unrealistic sports-related plots I've ever seen in a movie. 22 Jump Street, the sequel to 21 Jump Street, featured Channing Tatum's character Jinko being an undercover cop on a college campus and playing for the football team and being a key contributor at wide receiver, some might say his team's Lad McConkie, and this completely ruined the movie for me. I could not suspend disbelief enough to get past the NCAA allowing him to play even though his whole identity was a lie. I had to confirm all my information over and over just to play Division II basketball, and he was just able to hop on the team after pulling a George Santos? This is the same NCAA who is on Jim Harbaugh's ass for buying a recruit a hamburger? Can't be. Not to mention that if he had been Lad McConkie good, then wouldn't someone have recognized him on TV? Also, Channing had let himself go a little bit since his magic Mike heyday. He wasn't super fat or anything, but he definitely didn't look like a top-tier NCAA athlete, which is to say that his athleticism would have been quite sneaky. Mercifully, the first quarter came to an end while I got upset about this movie nearly a decade after it came out. 17-7 Georgia, but painfully obvious that TCU was completely overmatched. TCU's defense was over-pursuing everything Georgia did. Every play fake sent TCU defenders scrambling the wrong way. You could just see how nervous they were. My dear friend Petey, who's a big X's and O's and birds guy, pointed out in the group chat that the 3-3-5 defense that TCU plays was not going to be able to stop anything that Georgia does on offense. And that proved to be the most correct thing anybody has ever said in the history of the world. So because the TCU defense was super jumpy, and the first three in the 3-3-5 stands for playing only three down linemen, Georgia could beat them to the edge rushing the ball every single play. Now the five in a 3-3-5 defense stands for five defensive backs, so you'd think they would have had some luck stopping the pass, but that only works if the five know who they're covering. But this was a struggle, and sure enough, whoever was doing the sideline reporting for ESPN came back from one of those whopper, whopper, whopper commercial breaks whopper, 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 to say that TCU's defensive coordinator was frustrated because they kept lining up wrong on defense. And I have no idea how this happens multiple times. It's the same defense they've been running all year. How do you just forget where you're supposed to be? As a former basketball player, I've long held a very biased opinion that basketball players are smarter than football players, and I will be using TCU's inability to line up correctly as proof of that, along with the however many times a game football teams are penalized for having too many players on the field. In fairness to football players though, I imagine it's hard to count to 11 when you got your cleats on. Back to commercial breaks though, I wonder how much the person in charge of holding the stick with the TV timeout countdown clock gets paid because that seems like an easy job and I am interested. Now when I first typed that out in my notes app, it auto-corrected paid to laid, which is another good question. 
And do they bring the clock with them for that? I mean, three minutes seems a bit excessive. I've talked a lot about the great Georgia names, and we have another one, a young man they call Bear Alexander. Bear is a freshman defensive lineman who is 6'3 and weighs 305 pounds. As a college freshman, I weighed 165 pounds, and that's why nobody calls me Bear. The first half ended with a Georgia touchdown, followed by an awful throw by Max Duggan that was intercepted, and then another Georgia touchdown, all in the final minute 19. The score at halftime was Georgia 38, TCU 7, so instead of watching halftime analysis, I looked up stats for Elac's basketball team. That's the team featured in Netflix's Last Chance U. I finished the second season almost as soon as it came out, and I highly recommend it, so go ahead and watch that. They've got football versions too, but for those unfamiliar, it follows a junior college program, in this case basketball, and how the players ended up at that level, how their season goes, and all that fun stuff. To me, the basketball version has been more fun than the football versions because Elac's coach, John Mosley, is a hilarious person, and he seems to care about the kids as people way more than the football coaches did. So again, highly recommended, way more entertaining than the first half of this football game. So we get past halftime, my Elac research, and Georgia gets the ball first, and they had to punt. And Georgia's punter is a freshman from Australia, and he's 23 years old, which puts him on pace to be even older than Stetson Bennett when he graduates. And what's wild is he wasn't even the oldest punter in this game. TCU's punter, who is also Australian, shout out to Darren Bennett, no relation to Stetson, is a senior who is 29. Feels like a BYU game with all these old people. I wonder if I have any eligibility left. When the score was 45 to seven, a TCU defensive back was in the vicinity of an incomplete pass and he celebrated. This is one of my biggest sports pet peeves. I'm well aware of how old it makes me sound, but I hate DBs celebrating when they have nothing to do with why a pass is incomplete, especially when they're down 38 points in the national championship game and have been lining up wrong all game. Then not too long after that, McConkie caught another touchdown pass for Georgia. No clue where the aforementioned TCU DB was on that play, probably lined up wrong, and it was 52 to seven with two minutes and 17 seconds left in the third. And this is where I stopped watching because it was not a Saturday night and the game had already been over for like two quarters already. TCU never scored again as Georgia won 65 to seven. Stetson Bennett threw for four touchdowns, ran for another two. The Georgia players were eating wings on the sideline before the game was over. Just a complete shit show for TCU. And an incredibly disappointing end to a great college football season and incredible college football playoff for the rest of us. So how do we stop this from happening again? Well, the SEC should have their own final four and whoever wins that is the national champion. Let the other conferences continue with the expanded playoff and play for a best of the rest trophy. Before you fans of other conferences get super mad at me, just remember this means no more Dabo Sweeney National Championships. It's the perfect solution. But what a great season of college football. And I always get a little bit bummed when college football season ends because it means we're in the dead of winter and I hate winter, but we've got the Super Bowl on the way and everything else in the sports world is starting to ramp up too. So there's light at the end of this winter tunnel. So we'll get to the rest of the sports world ramping up soon enough, but that's gonna do it for this week's episode. You're probably already subscribed, so thank you for that. Now it's time to share it with everyone you've ever met. So go ahead, do that. Hit me up with any of your thoughts at beyondthearc843 at gmail.com. And I'll catch you next week unless they replace me with Pat McAfee.